Hello everyone, I am Deb Schur, Artistic Director of Avalok Farm Music Institute, and I am absolutely delighted to welcome you to Made at Avalok, our new series created to celebrate the variety and excellence of the work Avalok has supported. Each event will highlight one or two pro projects and will include discussions with musicians about process, as well as recorded performances of completed work. So far, Avalok has hosted over a thousand musicians in hundreds of groups and including dozens of composers. We hope you enjoy the diversity and depth of the genre and approaches to the creative process which will be presented here. Before we begin, however, I would like to thank a few people. First, our administrative team, Mason Donovan and Jenna Hall. Second, our musical team, Hannah Collins, Mike Compitello, Catherine Dowling, who joined me in creating these events. And last, but certainly not least, Fred Tauber, without whose generosity, the vision and inspiration of Avalok would never have come to be. So, thank you for joining us uh, for this ongoing celebration of creative work made at Avalok. Hello, everyone. Good evening. Welcome to this, the final Made at Avalok episode of our 2020 season. Um, tonight, we have, in our as a special guest, the tables have turned, the artistic director of Avalok Farm, Deb Schur, joining us, New Morse Code. Thanks for being here, Deb. I'm so glad to be Hi, here. It's, it's pretty exciting to be part of this final event. Um, I really appreciate your including me. Uh, we've been thinking about Made at Avalok now for months and months and months, and this is the culmination. So thanks for having me on. Of course, it didn't seem right to sign off without kind of just celebrating and, and thinking a little bit about how um, amazing it's been to be able to talk to all these different ensembles. And for me, the most exciting part has been seeing the results of these projects that were sometimes started uh, last summer, two summers ago, three summers ago, and have ended up in these amazing performances and recordings and videos. Um, I think we've learned a lot along the way. Yes. How has your experience been uh, as, a, as a host of this series? Well, I've, I've learned from you and Mike and Catherine <laughs> about how to do it, actually. It's, it's been wonderful. And I think part of what's been particularly pleasurable for me is that we've spanned many years actually of Avalok work and production in these events um, as well as so many different types of music and composers um, and it's really been a, a reflection of how much we've done which kind of brings me back to you guys and thinking about the fact that you were at Avalok the very first year 2013 and you had this brilliant idea which I have to admit I had not thought of, uh, which was to bring a composer with you. You had commissioned a composer and said, composer's available. Can we bring the composer with us? I thought, what a great idea. And thus started an incredible um, journey of composer um, ensemble collaborations, which took place at Avalon. So I thank you both for that. And you've continued it over all these years. Every year you've had somebody else um, and it really has become part of the fabric of Avalok um, that ensembles and composers can find that special connection at Avalok. Yeah. So thank you for that. Um, oh, oh still so have... here, <laughs> my dog. Ah, oh, oh, a favorite. <laughs> Come on up. Yeah. Many Avalok residents will recognize. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Anyway, I bring the dog, you bring the composers. <laughs> <laughs> Even, yeah. Well, thanks, Deb. Yeah, I mean, one thing Hannah and I have been talking about over this season is, is how the time at Avalok really meshes with the way that we like to work and the way that we like to collaborate, where we like to work with composers and, um, and musicians over sort of a longer period of time where the collaboration really becomes about the development of our relationship and the development of the music. And one thing about Avalok that's so special to us is that those summers that we spend there really fuel the rest of the year. And so mm -hmm. much of what we've done over the last seven years is directly traceable to time that we spent that we spent at Avalok. I mean, on our first album, Simplicity Itself, I think we worked on every piece there and worked with almost every composer 
uh, at Avalok, a recent album, Matt Barnson's piece, uh, Vanitas, which was just released last year on, on Innova. We worked on that entire piece with Matt over a series of summers. And uh, Chris Stark, um, his piece, The Language of Landscapes, was basically completely developed at Avalok and includes sounds that were recorded there mm -hmm. as well. And in addition to that, our good friend Thomas Kachev, um, who's a composer pianist, has been a number of times in this summer, we just released a new video of a piece that was also almost entirely developed at Avalok. That, that's so wonderful to hear. It really feels like the mission of Act. You're, you're a perfect example of um, seeing the mission of Avalok to fruition through your work there. So it makes me very happy. <laughs> I think one thing that's become clear this summer, since there is no Avalok and there's very little performing going on, is just how long lasting the the sort of roots of these projects um, grow. You know, um, for example, with Thomas, we just we did release a video this summer um, that we actually made while in residence at Avalok last summer, um, and we had been working on the piece even you know a previous time. So. Um, even though the performing world has sort of hit pause, we're still seeing, you know, albums being released and, and pieces being completed that ha have been in the works for years. Um, what we did get to do a little bit of performing this summer virtually um, with Thomas. So we'd love to share that with everyone right now. Um, yeah. As part of our our plans um, this past summer was to work with Thomas again and to go over to the Electric Earth concert series nearby in New Hampshire um, and play a trio concert. And of course, we weren't able to assemble ourselves. Um, Thomas is based in LA, so that was definitely not a possibility. But we were able to assemble a virtual concert and we, we put together this little movement from Mark Mellis's trio, Tight Sweater, which we'll share. We'll share now. This was our our summer, one of our summer uh, activities. Great. really wonderful to experience. Uh, thank you so much for sharing it. 
Um, I'm going to turn the tables on you a little bit here and uh, turn into the host for a second. I just am curious, having watched your career over these seven years, eight years, uh, what's next for you? What, what, what else is on the horizon for New Morse Code? Well, it's actually been a very interesting time. Um, as we mentioned, you know, there were some things we were able to share this summer, including the, the a longer piece that Thomas wrote for us, um, which we'll we'll link to below. Um, we were also able to put out a, a short album called "The Emigrants," which is a, a long term project we have been working on with our friend, the composer George Lamb, which is about. Um, it's for cello and percussion and the pre-recorded voices of immigrant musicians living in Queens, New York, and sort of their stories and how music has, has come to play and we've, um, in their lives as, as new Americans and New Yorkers. Um, so that's out as an EP on Bandcamp, and um, that's been really exciting to be able to, to get that out into the world. And we just finished streaming a, a big opera project um, called Driving While B Black, um, which we, uh, in which we were the orchestra to support the, the soprano Roberta Gumbel, who wrote a libretto about her own experience raising her African-American son and teaching him how to drive and just sort of the anxieties associated with, with that. Um, and music's by Susan Kander, and we were able to um, make a video premiere to replace a live performance, which was actually a really rewarding experience that was kind of a, an opportunity and a, a different way of looking at the music that was brought on by the, the, the pandemic. So um, we're, we've sort of uh, been really excited to actually get those projects into a place that more people can can listen to them and see them. And yeah, now we're on to planning um, a next big project. I'll kick it to Mike. We have a, a really exciting yeah. tour coming up. Yeah, we were fortunate enough recently to be awarded uh, this Impact Performance Prize by Ariel Artists, Ariel Avant Impact Performance Prize, which is going to enable us to work with our friend Chris Stark on his piece, The Language of Landscapes, and commission a new piece from longtime Avalok alum Andy Akiho. Um, the mission was sort of to uh, take a look at some of the UN sustainable development goals. And so our project is kind of about uh, combining climate action or thinking about our ongoing climate crisis with some thoughts of, of, of hope relative to uh, space exploration, in particular this OSIRIS-REx mission mm -hmm. to the Bennu asteroid. I don't know if you've been following it, but they landed a SUV sized satellite on an asteroid recently. <laughs> Yeah, so as part of that, we're going to be taking a tour of five cities and developing engagement activities uh, within those communities over the next couple of years. And so we're really excited about that. And especially since Andy is so near and dear to the Avalok mm. community, uh, we're really excited to sort of bring that, bring that project together. And then I think uh, this evening we, we wanted to share two collaborations. And so we're going to be talking with composer Robert Hanstein, longtime Avalok, uh, alum and composer David Crowell, who worked with us a couple summers ago, and we're going to be sharing two projects that each sort of are kind of representative of, of ways in which people have worked together at Avalok. One is sort of a really long simmering stew of a collaboration, and some the other one is a sort of bringing together of a whole community of, of people over a single piece. So that's kind of what's on the horizon for us, and we're really excited about it. It's amazing so much. You know, I was just thinking, listening to you and being together with you two this way, how exciting it is to have watched your trajectory um, through Avalok and that this Made at Avalok, uh, these presentations have basically given us a chance to see the tra trajectory of all these ensembles that, that we're, we've been uh, showcasing. And that's what it's about as far as I'm concerned. Um, so it's thrilling and I'm thrilled for you too that you're getting so much um, to do and so many interesting projects and um, it's not only Avalok but it's you and it's this, that's the way it is with all the musicians I think. Avalok brings it out and gives them a chance but bravo to you. Thanks so much for, for being with us Deb. I mean I, I think I can speak yeah. for both of us when I say nothing motivates us more than other creative people 
Um, and that is just the constant, yeah, inspiration and motivation. And, and that's something that, you know, we see in the Avalok community, whether we're virtual mm -hmm. or in person. Um, so I think that that's just at the heart of everything we do. And certainly, you know, many of the people who are part of this community and mm -hmm. you too, as a musician and a, and a an influence and a creator of spaces like this for people to work in. So thanks for spending well, this time with us. Great, great to be with you. And I can't yes. wait to see the rest of your work um, and uh, love you both. Aww. So we're gonna Thanks, let Deb, Deb go. <laughs> um, enjoy the rest of the evening. And we're gonna up next have a quick conversation with Robert Hanstein. So to lead into that, we're gonna play a little snippet, a movement from the piece he wrote for us called the piece is called down down baby and the movement is called singing lesson and when we come back he'll join us for a conversation Okay, we're back and we're lucky to be joined by the composer of Singing Lesson, Robert Hanstein. Robert, thank you so much for joining us this evening. My pleasure, it's so nice to be here. Hello, hi. Yeah, um, I mean, we were just talking with, with Deb about this, this fantastic piece and we're kind of curious if you would lead us through sort of the collaborations and the history of what brought us to this project, Down Down Baby. Absolutely. It's, I mean, of all the pieces I've written, I think the backstory to this might be one of the most epic. Um, so, you know, it really, honestly, I, I would say, I would argue, it goes back to like my undergraduate years when I first met Hannah. We were both undergrads together. And I don't 
remember it so well, but I believe Hannah did play in some of the pieces I wrote uh, back at that time. I've since um, put those in a drawer deep and I don't really even recall the details, but- I know, do so remember, that, I do oh. remember that in a group of, of, of pieces that were written by different people, you had the best quality paper. Ha, that's hilarious. I, okay, good to know. I'm glad that something important like that really stood out. Um, so yeah, so that, and then like fast forward a few years and we were all at grad school and um, I, I guess I got to know Mike a little bit. And then soon after grad school, when Hannah and Mike were just forming New Morse Code, little known fact, perhaps, perhaps a trivia, in the initial iteration, you included a viola. Is that right? That was part of the yes. original lineup? Yes, and yeah, correct. Yeah. 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 And so as part of that, you, you asked if I had any work. And um, I had this one piece called Patter that I adapted um, for for viola, cello, and marimba. And I think that was the first time we kind of worked together. And that was really fun. And um, soon after that, the idea of a commission for a new piece came up. And we had lots of meetings and we had lots of ideas. And I, I think it took maybe two, three, four years, maybe even five, I think more like three or four years from that sort of first like meeting, let's talk about a piece, to me actually sitting down and trying to write a piece. And so fast forward to, I don't know if it was like 2014 or 2015, um, we, were, we were brainstorming, getting ideas, and we got together at this uh, festival called Lake George, and we did some initial um, sort of make sounds experiments in a room, and I sampled a lot of things, and I went home, and about a year later, I basically said, I have no idea what I'm going to do, but I wrote this other piece instead on the side. This is not the piece, it's this other piece. And that's how we got this piece called Unwind, which you also played, which is not Down Down Baby, but it was sort of a, you know, a consequence. Um, but soon after that, I finally kind of figured out what I was gonna do. And um, I started writing this piece, Down Down Baby. And I, I think, you know, what kind of took me so long to get to it was one of the challenges you posed me with was you wanted me to write something that really challenged your roles in the group. You know, Mike, the percussionist, Hannah, the cellist. You wanted something that wasn't just, you know, idiomatic percussion, idiomatic uh, cello music. You wanted something that would kind of bring you out of the comfort zone. And I, I really took that idea to heart. So I, I had this idea of taking the cello and turning it into a percussion uh instrument so that literally the two of you can kind of meet halfway i put it on a table and the two of you face each other and and that was kind of the impetus for this whole arrangement and i thought this was kind of cool because you know mike you were kind of taken out of your comfort zone and going to the string zone and hannah you were still playing the cello technically speaking but you were playing it like a, a percussionist and um you know the the sort of nature of this really unusual setup i think just required this very um, intricate, in-depth process of collaboration, which, you know, really, I think it was at, at Avalok over maybe two summers, honestly. I think the first summer I came there for a couple of days and we just kind of tried out the setup and got a feel of how things went. And then I was basically wrote the piece over the next year. And then the next summer we, we got very in-depth because uh, I basically finished the piece and piece into refining it and tweaking it. But, but I mean, really, um, the whole conceit of the setup and the approach and the sort of music was born from this notion of trying to have the two of you um, come outside of your, your usual place and find a space in the middle where you could both be equally comfortable and uncomfortable. And I think I succeeded in that, at least in that I don't much. Know. I think we are equally <laughs> uncomfortable. Yes, yeah. I think well, I'll choose that side as well, us. yeah. Um, yeah. You know, just for context, for some of the people listening, I, I, I believe, Mike, you can fact check me here, that first concert New Morse Code ever gave where we played a piece by Robert was exactly nine years ago this week. It uh, was, yeah. Really? October right. 2011. Yeah. So yeah. that was, yeah. and a shout out to our, who we call New Morse Code Emerita. Emerita. It was Anne Lanzalotti, the composer, yes. and she's the MPAC curator and the fa yeah. fantastic um musician and, and art creator. Um, so, mm -hmm. and the well, other piece of context was that part of that workshop session that we did at Lake George Music Festival happened to be in a in a Sunday school space that was just very, right. I just remember it as being colorful and sort of full of, of actually kind of musical toys and, and different types of, of activities. And I, you've talked a little bit about the logistics of how the piece is set up, but um, what about the spirit of it? I mean, where did yeah. that come from? Yeah, absolutely. So the spirit, so Down Down Baby, you know, that refers to these clap, uh, clapping game that kids often play. 
And the whole spirit of sort of childhood and discovery, it came really directly from my personal life, which was that the, the summer that I, that I really wrote it, like when I had arrived at the concept and I was really just kind of getting into it, that summer was the summer after my, my first child was born, my son, Henry. So I was, you know, I think in the summer, he was maybe three, four months old. And as a new dad with uh, this little baby, I was really seeing the world through his eyes and I was really imagining, you know, how it must be for, for a little child to, to see everything fresh for the first time. And I took that idea to the cello and that was another impetus for kind of putting on the table. I was, I, I asked myself the question, I was like, if I were a child, you know, a baby or a toddler and, um, and I encountered this, this thing, what on earth would I think of it? Well, the first thing that became clear is I definitely wouldn't play it like a cello. I definitely wouldn't use a bow and I wouldn't sit and do all these things. I would probably just sort of touch it and feel it and maybe gradually I'd start to kind of make some sounds. And and I mean, actually, that's honestly how the piece, um, well, that, no, that follow leader doesn't quite begin that way, but there are these movements where um, you just sort of do that. And that, that idea of just discovering the instrument through touching and sort of then the consequence of that is sort of you end up reinventing the sound world. That really came from this notion of seeing the world through the eyes of a child. And, and that aspect of, of, of childhood, I guess, then infected the whole narrative of the piece, which is that each movement is a, a kind of imagined little vignette or a scene, you know, from childhood. So like singing lesson, we just saw that's, um, you know, as it's the notion of like learning to sing or like um, that can, these kind of simple childhood musical experiences. And then other movements have a similar character we're going to hear one um, in a little bit called strange dance which really the, honestly that idea is just I, as anyone who's been around kids they tend to just do funny things for no particular reason and it's kind of amazing so strange dances and just the kind of whimsy of it all and you know each movement follow the leader is the first movement that's obviously a childhood game um the last movement down down baby self you know the eponymous uh movement that's obviously a childhood game i might be missing a movement uh but um yeah, so it's all, it all kind of came from this notion of childhood, which came from me being a new dad and having a little kid crawling around. <laughs> yeah. yeah, great. So, I mean, uh, as you just mentioned, we're going to hear another movement uh, called Strange Dance. So if, if you want to give us a few things to listen for in this movement, Absolutely. that'd be great. Um, yeah, so, so Strange Dance, this is definitely one of my... Uh, favorite movements. I don't know, there's something about it which I find really quirky and really fun. It's also probably the funkiest movement, I would say. But um, like I said, it's pure whimsy. It's the notion of like, sometimes when you're with kids, you just start doing crazy stuff. And, uh, and um, I think the music reflects that. And I also say, technically speaking, you know, I had put, especially Hannah in this position of being a percussionist for this entire piece. But this is one movement where I think you do get to access your cello skills. And you kind of play a sort of funny little pluck solo, pizzicato solo on top of it while there's this kind of quirky rhythm going on behind it. But um, I mean, that's really the idea of this movement. It's just like a quirky, whimsical, sort of funny thing that happens. And, it, and I really just take that and roll with it. And I think you're, you'll hear that um, kind of spin out in a, in, a, in a cool way. Yeah. Yeah, I definitely um, do feel like this is the one where my... Um cello skills and just enjoying kind of the sonority of the pizzicati and sliding around really comes through. And yeah. one of my favorite memories of playing this movement was the first time we ever played it for other people, which was at Avalok. And we, you right. know, there was a sharing session with, I remember that night in particular, there were many, many people playing. It's different epic music. night. Yeah. 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 And, you know, you have a flute sonata and a, and a song and all this different stuff. And then we brought this setup, which you've already seen out and it, it and we encourage everyone to come around us. I think we can show a picture as we speak yeah, about yeah. this. Um, mm -hmm. And it, it almost had the feeling to me, especially because I'm a cellist and not used to seeing a cello on a table like that, but it was like one of those mm -hmm portraits of a surgical theater you know yeah. where everyone's yeah. kind of gathered around what's going on there what are they doing to that thing yeah. um yeah and so that was like a particularly kind of memorable moment um yeah. and mm -hmm. what we're about to return to is is a video that we made together and maybe if you want oh, to yeah. explain a little bit right. about where it is yeah mm -hmm. absolutely so um we collaborated with uh 410 media which um 
at the time, I don't know if they were called 410, but the, the, they're just Evan Chapman and Kevin Eichenberg. And I've done a lot of, well, all of us have done quite a lot of video projects with them. This particular concept, um, we wanted to you know, play off the childhood theme and we found a playground in Philadelphia near where Evan lives. And <laughs> it was really a kind of a funny video shoot. I don't think we officially got permission or a permit or anything, but we just took our whole setup and we just set it up in the park and uh, we filmed the, the, the shoot, but it kind of in the background, there is an actual playground and actual children running around. And I, I don't know if it's this movement in this part of the video, but definitely in some of the other movements, you can really, some kids kind of walk up or they run by, you can see them curious and they run away. And um, it's just sort of a funny, it's a funny environment. Um, but yeah, yeah, that's, it's a kind of unique setting for the music video, absolutely. Yeah, so I, I think probably we'll watch that now, yeah? Yeah, let's watch it. Okay, cue it up. <laughs> All right. Yeah, I remember that being a really fun focusing exercise, filming that video out in the playground in Maniunk with everybody there. But Robert, before we let you go today, I, we wanted to ask sort of what can everybody watching look forward to from you? What have you been up oh, to and absolutely. what's upcoming that we can, we can all check out? Okay, well, so I'll tell you something that just came up. Um, is that everyone I would love to check out is I just had an album come out. It, it came out in August, but it's still very fresh in my mind. It's called Soul House. 
and um, you can check that out. Um, I maybe other I can put a link somewhere in this. And that's a, a long piece I wrote, also kind of a personal narrative about the house I grew up in, my childhood home. And it's a I wrote it for a group called Hub New Music, which I think has also spent time at Avalon. And um, yeah, so I'm, I'm very proud and excited about that project. So that's something you could all check out. And then for uh, future things, I'm, I'm at, at the moment, I'm writing a uh, percussion duo um, for a group called the Arts Duo. They are based in Seattle. And so I'm really in the thick of that, deep into writing that piece. And I think, uh, I don't know exactly, you know, because of COVID, I'm not sure what the premiere is going to look like, but it'll probably be early 2021, um, maybe even a digital um, type of situation that will come up. But so that's my current my current project. And um, yeah, more more things in the future, but I'll, I'll leave it at that. How about? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, great. Well, Robert, thank you so much for joining us. I mean, over the years, uh, we've had a lot of time together at Avalok, both with our projects and with, um, with you working with other people. And, you know, it's great to see you that now since the season isn't happening as it normally would. And we hope to see you again sometime soon. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I can't say enough how, how uh, important Avalok has been as an experience for me. I, I take pride in that I, I think have some way or another made my, been there. I think for almost almost every summer <laughs> since it started, or at least since the two of you have been there, I have found a way to either whether it's just for a day or for an actual you know residency. And so it was definitely I definitely was sad not to be there at all this summer, but mm -hmm. I, I know I'll be back in the future. And it's really spurned an enormous. I mean, just with the two of you, you know, unwind, down down baby, Mike, you and I, this whole piece lost and found that um, we're mm -hmm. recording right now, which incidentally, actually, I think. I think that grew out of Down Down My Baby in some way. It did. It uses yeah. the yeah. sidebar. This is a marimba right. solo that Robert wrote for, for me and a consortium of percussionists, which is based upon sounds that we recorded originally for the Down Down Baby That's duo right. and ended up not yeah. using. Yeah. That's right. When I told the original story and I, I got stuck and I ended up writing this other piece, Unwind, instead, it was because I was working with that setup we had developed, but then I, we ended up doing it for a solo piece. But yeah, you know... A lot of great memories and pieces and collaborations that have come out of it. It's really just incredible. So uh, yeah, thanks, uh, thanks everyone for checking this out. And thanks for having me on this um, show. It's great uh, to see you, podcast. Robert. We we hope yeah. to see you back there then soon. So. Absolutely, yeah, wonderful. See you soon. Bye. 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 Okay, hi everyone. We're back, and we're lucky to be joined by composer David Crowell. David. Thank you for joining us this evening. And we were fortunate enough to work with you on a piece, uh, actually a consortium project for cellos and percussionists um, called Catharsis. And we're gonna listen to that tonight, but we wanted to turn it over to you to tell us a little bit about this project and sort of how we worked on it together. Sure, yeah, thank you for having me. Um, it's great to connect over this project again. Um, so yeah, this is, um, a consortium project that involved uh, 20 percussionists and cellists. Um, and um, we, I, I wrote the piece over uh, probably a month or two and then um, came up to Avalok in July, I believe, um, for a couple of days to kind of uh, work through it um, with the two of you. And then um, after that, we went down to uh, Guilford Sound, which is a wonderful studio in Vermont um, that um, many, many people have recorded there that we know. Um, so it, it was a wonderful experience doing that. Um, and then, you know, we kind of just uh, produced the recording and, and um, we're, we're a little bit on pause now with performance stuff, um, but we hope to um, do some, some fully live performances with uh, other members of the consortium at some point when that is possible. Yeah, amazing. You know, I have been thinking about uh, in preparing for t this conversation, you know, just remembering being down at Guilford, um, Guilford Sound. And of yeah. course, we, we set out to write a piece or to create a piece that could have, you know, multiple cellists and percussionists either playing live or playing in combination with recorded tracks. But what I loved about recording it was that when we were in the studio, um, it feels like, you know, you're, you are part of this chamber music group too. Like we literally had an opportunity to, to track in some of your playing 
mm -hmm. um, into the electronics because there's an electronics element and yeah. the the creativity of just not having totally decided exactly what would be the final electronics element made it like such a, a interactive collaboration. Um, yeah, I, I yeah. think, um, I mean, we did a lot of work on, on the cello parts. And so that was something that we spent a lot of time on sort of at Avalok. So that was a, a continuing process. And then being in the studio, um, we did a lot of stuff in two days. It was pretty remarkable. Um, and Hannah, you had, um, well, you both had a, a lot of work to do. <laughs> uh, Mostly Hannah, yeah. Well, don't sell yourself short. <laughs> uh, but yeah, th then um, I, I think you're right. We were, we, we, we made quite a few decisions in the studio uh, based on what we were hearing um, in terms of uh, a lot of in terms of the cello stuff um uh and also um i ended up playing some guitar um which was completely unplanned um but uh yeah so in that way it was um it was really cool to to use the studio as as a as a collaborator and for then for us to continue the collaboration it felt very alive and and really satisfying um when we came out it felt like we've really done something, you know, <laughs> we really connected over this music in, in a pretty intense way um, because we were really only there. I think we only were together for four days or maybe five, I can't remember, but um, the, the, the Avalok stay was um, two or three days and then we drove down and spent two days in the studio. So um, we got a lot done in a very short period of time. It was very, very productive. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, definitely. And I remember when we first started thinking about this project with you, we had the idea to, to, to fund it with a consortium, meaning that a lot of percussionists, and a lot of cellists would all kind of help support the project. And I remember at some point we decided that it would be really interesting to have a piece where, where it's not just sort of for two people, uh, that, that more members of the consortium could play it together. So I'm wondering, in sort of thinking about listening to the piece uh, in a few minutes, or if you could talk about how you approached writing sort of not just for one duo, but for multiple layers of cello and percussion, and also voice and yeah. electric guitar. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, the, the, the first movement um, has some electronics in it, definitely, but they're a little more subtle. And then the second movement really expands its textural palette. You know, there's um, Hannah's voice, um, the electronics are more present. Um, there's some samples, there's electric guitar, uh, there's tree frogs, which is also a great story <laughs> we could, <laughs> could talk about if you want. Um, but yeah, I, I, to respond to your question, I think um, I, I generally enjoy writing these types of pieces because I, I always love to look for composite sounds rather than soloistic sounds. So um, it was actually a very natural experience for me as a composer and something I've done a lot of. Um, so it felt very comfortable. Um, and it, in just knowing that, uh, the, 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 the incredible like quality and musicianship of the people in the consortium just sort of felt like I could do anything. Um, and we would be able to figure it out. So, uh, yeah, very freeing process, um, different in some ways, but also familiar, um, based on some other projects I've done in the past. So I, I felt like I had kind of a roadmap for, for how to do it, even though the piece itself is quite different in some ways. Yeah, so you mentioned there are two movements. Do you wanna give our, our audience a little bit of a listening guide right now and then we'll listen to the piece? Sure, yeah, I think, um, I think the two movements are quite different. I think they're uh, sort of opposite uh, reflections on on a catharsis, uh, the name of the piece. Um, uh, the first movement is very uh, rhythmic, fast, um, uh, kind of hectic um, in some ways. There's a lot of feeling of sort of stopping and starting. And then finally, at the end of the piece, there's just a full sort of outpouring, I guess, um, musically and emotionally. Um, and so I think that that's kind of tracks that that theme of catharsis. And then the second movement is uh, musically uses some of the same rhythmic ideas, uh, but just places it in a completely different context, um, which I think will be um, 
pretty clear when you listen to it. Um, I, I think the the sort of bed sound of that is actually electronics, um, which is quite different from the first movement. Um, so everything kind of springs from from the the feeling of those electronics, which are very sort of moody and, and inward looking. I would say. Awesome. Yeah. I mean, the thing thinking about this, and then also talking to Robert. I mean, in Robert's piece, I remember he he said that he wanted to write something that sort of challenged the two of us to do the same thing. And I think what I really love about your piece is that it kind of does the same thing where um, in some moments of the piece, the challenge is for Hannah and I to sound like one composite sound, like you said. And then in other moments of the piece, we kind of spread off into our own worlds. And I think that the attention to texture there is something that as a duo, we don't normally get to experience. You know, normally we sort of just have two layers that we're dealing with. And in this piece, there's this really wide, swath of color there and the density of sound that's really really amazing yeah and i i think the i mentioned earlier that i like composite sounds maybe a little more than soloistic sounds um but one of the reasons that this piece is different is that i really wanted to have very lyrical moments in it and that was that was a goal uh you know especially in the second movement and i i think it you guys sound so great doing it <laughs> it was like a real pleasure to hear it come together and I, well, I, we can we can let our listeners decide. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, I think I think um, it's it's a challenge uh, recording a piece like this because um, you have to sort of make these interpretive decisions, and then without hearing all of it when you begin, um, I'm sure you guys felt this, right? You know, where you're. Um, you're recording the initial parts and and so it really takes kind of a a vision to pull pull it pull it off um and i and i i think it i think you did <laughs> i guess we'll let our audience decide <laughs> what a great segue we should listen to the piece now um so this is catharsis by david crawl and it's two movements long and we'll come back once it's over <laughs>
चीजें पड़ी हैं और पंद्रह मिनट से आगे मैं बढ़ना नहीं चाहता हूं
well <laughs> it's nice to hear that again and i don't know the meaning of the piece is shifting in my mind it's i think it's been about two years since we made those tracks and mm -hmm. a lot has happened since then um yeah. So it's really nice to, to hear back and, and be thinking about that collaboration that we, we did. And as David mentioned, um, the 20 members of the consortium, hopefully, you know, we're planning uh, when things get a little bit more back to normal to, to go ahead with those plans to do live versions of this piece with multiple cellists and multiple percussionists and any possible combination we can come up with. So that's an exciting, uh, exciting thing to think about in the future. But yep. meanwhile, David, we wanted to ask you, um, what else is going on with you? What other projects do you have um, to look forward to? Uh, yeah, I'm kind of working on a, a couple pieces simultaneously at the moment, which are very different. Uh, one is a, a double guitar concerto uh, for Dan LaPel and um, Andrew Smiley. Uh, and I'm also writing um, a cello, cello voice piece um, for Eva Kashian Lakosh, which is going to be using a lot of granular synthesis. Um, so I've been kind of uh, going at that. Um, yeah, and then I, I have a, a residency coming up in the spring. I'm going to be working uh, at Dunbar and Oaks. I'm going to be working on a piece for Argus Quartet. So excited about that too. Amazing. And Argus is another group familiar to, to us. Definitely. Yes. Yeah. Sounds like a lot of fun. Yeah. And Joe Joe Wang from Argus Quartet was one of the cellists in our yep. consortium. So exactly, that's how I met her. So yeah, nice. <laughs> yeah. I, I went to see them play um, a few times in New York and was totally blown away by how good they are. Yeah, <laughs> yes. Definitely. Totally. For sure. Yeah. yeah, and we're really looking forward to getting a chance to work with her and the other members of the consortium on this piece yep. again in the future. And. But in the meantime, yeah. thanks so much for joining us, David. It's yeah. great to touch base. Great to see you again. Yeah, and, you uh, yeah, yeah. thanks for, for having me. And um, yeah, it's very exciting to see your faces again. <laughs> you too. Yeah. All right, stay tuned. All right, yeah. Catharsis will be back soon. Right. Yes, see you thanks, later. David. Okay, right. bye. Welcome back everyone. We have one last special guest today and we're thrilled to invite Chef Pete Novum to our Made at Avalok episode here. Hi Pete. Hi Pete. Um, we have been you know talking to different groups every week over the over the course of the season and every single group when you ask them what's their favorite memory at Avalok or their their you know um, the thing they miss the most, it's always the food, um, interacting with the kitchen staff and with Pete and, and just enjoying all the creativity and inspiration that comes from your end of things. So we thought due to popular demand, we would have to check in with, with Pete and the, the Avalok test kitchen and see what's going on there. So Pete, how are you doing? What have you been up to? <laughs> hey guys. Um, you know, it's been, it, thanks for including me in this. I know that I, I, I normally work in the background uh, while you guys create fantastic music and, and all sorts of wonderful projects. So it's cool to be included in this, but um, yeah, it's been an interesting year. Um, not, not spending the summer in Boscoin and making food there, uh, but I've been up to a bunch of different stuff. I've been working on some projects for them. You guys, if some people know this, but I'm a ski instructor in the winter by trade and I'm actually, uh, I work for the Ski Instructors Association and we create educational content and run exams for ski instructors. Um, so I've done some projects for them. I worked on some projects for me. I went mountain biking a whole bunch. I got a dog um, and I basically made ridiculous projects for Carrie and uh, her being, I don't know how to cook for one person is what I've realized or realized again this summer, because every time I go to make something, it's like, all right, I'm going to make like four dozen cookies. Oh, wait. <laughs> Your minimum is 30 right now. <laughs> yeah, I don't know how to do it. It's like, I, I think I went through uh, 150 pounds of flour. But what I would do is I would make, every time I make a batch of bread, I'd keep one loaf for me, and give one loaf away so that I still get to share kind of that 
that experience of people. I just randomly would like ring the doorbell at my friend's house and leave a paper bag with a, a, a loaf of sourdough on their front porch and run away. And uh, that's like the best. Re- re- I know. Yeah. Out What's there. your address again? Yeah. <laughs> so, so, I did the ones with, yeah. So, you know, most of us over the last months have been hunkering down and working on our cooking skills. Either we're wrangling sourdough starters or we're working on our baking or something else. So what should we be working on? I mean, I know that over the summers, I really appreciate getting cooking ideas and cooking tips from you. So what what are some of the things that you've made in your test kitchen over the last months that you would have unfurled this year that we should be we should be look, looking to do ourselves uh, at home? Awesome. Well, it's a good question. And, uh, you know, I think when you have more time and what people should realize is they shouldn't be afraid to try lengthy projects, right? So oftentimes most like sourdough has gone through the roof this summer just as like a trend with everybody because normally you, you don't, you can't just like mix some flour or water together and leave it alone for 12 hours, right? Like you, you might be able to do part, you might do part of it, but then your life gets in the way. So I, I'd encourage people to spend some time with bread. I find it to be quite meditative. I can say that like we had decent bread, we're already using sourdough at Avalok, but I definitely improved mine because I got to watch it much more closely, right? You know, I'd be working and I'd have a timer set and I, you know, I, uh, it takes about three days to make a good loaf of sourdough, sort of the process that, that I do. And, and I've definitely figured out how to get more specifically for me, good oven spring. So if you're a sourdough person out there, um, I figured out how to get pretty decent oven spring. And the trick for me was uh, making sure that the I was really cognizant of how far the sourdough starter had uh, traveled in its path, right? So like it doubles in size when you feed it, right? So it has this moment in time where it's still on the way up and then about to fall. And I think that when I was busier and doing more things, I would let it fall a little bit. And that means already some of the yeast is starting to die. Um, and so I, I got really good at getting the exact right amount of uh, time in and then the, it's the most yeast possible per, you know, cubic inch or whatever. <laughs> I don't know exactly what the terminology would be, but that was one thing. Um, you know, I personally have never been that great at making fresh pasta. So I spent some time this summer rolling out pasta and making tortellini and pappardelle and other stuff like that. And that's uh, a guaranteed crowd pleaser. And it's pretty easy. You know, you can open the fridge and you can be like, I have nothing, but you have like one egg and like some crusty old flour in the, in the, can- in the cupboard somewhere. And you actually have the ingredients to make pasta. Add some butter and maybe some salt or maybe some cheese and, and <laughs> you've got a meal and it's pretty cool. Um, pretty labor intensive, but you can do it with you know, you can do it with a fancy roller like I have where you attach it to the KitchenAid and it goes through, or you can do it with a wine bottle. And then, oh no, you have to drink a bottle of wine. <laughs> the wine bottle. Uh, and you're making making me hungry just talking about I know, about yeah. This. Yeah, and I, yeah, and I do think, um, you know, it, there, there's, don't be afraid to try weird combinations and try weird things is what I would say. And I think that's what, you know, when you're living in a pandemic and every time you go to the grocery store, you think about like, all right, do I really need to go? That's when you start digging deeper into your pantry for like creative odd things, right? And you're like, I have a can of chickpeas and I have what, some artichokes and some sort of somewhat still edible broccoli. I can do something with this. No, I can't. <laughs> Pete, I got a question for you. You know sure. what? When we, when we talk to musical ensembles about being at Avalok, they always mentioned how they work differently when they're there, just knowing that, you know, there's another group down the hall that's, you know, um, just like working like crazy, or there's, you know, they're so inspired by hearing someone perform in the evening that it motivates them to kind of change the way they're thinking about their own work. And, and people mention your work as well when they're, when they're kind of talking about what makes the environment feel so creative and, and just motivating. And I was just wondering, you know, how you feel in that kitchen versus cooking at home or, you know, what is it, how does it change the way that you work to be in that kind of setup? 
I mean, I agree. It goes both ways that I know that the people that are there are working incredibly hard and are incredibly talented. And I want to put out something that's worthy of that energy. Right. So I think it, it maybe doesn't force you, but it, it puts you in a mindset where you, everything needs to be really good. And it's not, I'm not saying we always hit that mark, but um, you know, the beauty of food is you're, you're making food constantly. So uh, it's, it's, I think it's a quite healthy outlook because if you, if you mess something up, there's always the next thing that you're going to make. Right. Uh, but I, I think that's usually important and I missed it this year. It's definitely a creative outlet for me, but also it makes people happy and, you know, we need more of that. <laughs> what do you think the all time fan favorite desserts you've made are? I mean, that's really personal though, right? Because Oh, yeah, has a different thing that they really like. And usually favorites are connected to emotions, right? So like people's eyes light up when they see an ice cream sandwich. And to me, that's not my favorite thing we make, although it's really good, you know, mm. literally just taking one of Diane's cookies and like under baking it, right? So we under bake it so it's not rock hard. We add a slightly different chocolate in it so that it you're not like biting into a whole huge chocolate chunk. But then we're putting Richardson's ice cream in it. We didn't even make the ice cream. We, we spent a lot of time laboring over like much more complicated desserts, mm -hmm. um, but people will go crazy for an ice cream sandwich because it needs something that turns them into a, like a six-year-old kid again, who's yeah. like at mom's table, like, oh, you made ice cream sandwiches, right? It, so my you know, favorite has always been the, the birthday cake you would make for Hannah each summer. So the joys of having a summer birthday. So, did you get a birthday cake this summer? I did. You know, I actually was able to spend my birthday with my family. So that was, uh, we, we did a peach custard pie, actually, which was I, I do, I think pie is, is an underrated uh, celebratory dish. I made with you. 40 pies, I think, for my sister's uh, uh, wedding celebration that she had a, a, a party in Brooklyn. And it was super fun. But yeah, so like people really like that mango ice cream. I think that's probably one of the top ones, ice cream sandwiches. And then maybe, and again, you know, what's funny. That mango ice cream is really easy. It's got five ingredients and it takes me two minutes to whip the batter up. The only time that you put into it is in the machine and then in making sure that it's stored properly so it doesn't crystallize. Um, oh, man. No, so, so, I mean, I know that you've told some people about this, but what can we look forward to in terms of a, an Avalok cookbook? Is it coming? That's the question on everybody's mind, summer 2020. So I have a outline and I, I kind of know what recipes I want in it, but you know, I'm still trying to figure out how to do it justice. I think format is important. And so what I realized, I hit a point this summer because I started putting a cookbook together and I have some recipes, um, you know, already made. I just have to scale them down because most of the recipes are for like 24 to 30 people. Um, and I think an ideal cookbook, so here's what I can tell you. I think that an ideal cookbook has really great pictures and makes the food seem automatically appealing. It's probably for about four to six people because that makes for a built-in like small house party, right? where you have your friends over. And four to six is great because you could do a dozen and it's easy to double things. Um, and, you know, it, it needs to have a mixture of like more complicated, but also more attainable recipes made with really normal ingredients. So there might be some stuff in there as simple as like the, the um, uh, Middle Eastern chopped salad that we do with like a ton of herbs and chopped cucumbers and tomatoes and chickpeas and stuff like that. Those are all really basic ingredients, but when you put it together and you get the like the balance of acid, salt, fat, and like there's a lot of olive oil in there and it's, it's awesome. So stuff like that. Nice. You know, I think that for something that if people want to watch something right now, we're, we're going to put a link in the description below to a video you made recently. You want to explain a little bit about what, what went into that? Yeah, absolutely. So this was an interesting summer because I kind of started doing 
I, I started combining my two passions in a way that I'd never really done before. So I, I worked for the Ski Instructors Association in the winter, and we did a webinar on nutrition, and we talked a lot about how food is processed and what is good nutrients or helpful nutrients. And uh, there's a pretty direct correlation between eating well and like good energy, which also could mean safety, right? You're more less likely to have an injury if your energy is following a, a more even curve. And so one of the most nutrient packed ways you can, you can absorb food is like, and quickly I should say is a juice. So I made a, um, I made a, a, a juice based off of this business I used to manage. I used to run a juice vending business called the Juice Caboose. And we made this, this drink called the Liquid Lunch. Um, and then in this instance, there's kind of a twist and then I turned it into a cocktail at the end. Um, so at my local watering hole, which happens to have one of the best bartenders in the state, he makes this drink called the Dead Beat. And uh, he, his version is a little different, but that was the inspiration for this. So you, you take that fresh juice, uh, I added some gin to it and uh, an egg white and shook it up with a little maple syrup. And it was, honestly, it was one of the best cocktails I had all summer and I didn't even garnish it. I just poured it into a mason jar and drank it, drank it, so. <laughs> wow, sounds amazing. Uh, well, Pete, thank you for joining us. And, you know, from Hannah and I, this is the, we're so grateful. This is the end of our Made at Avalox series. And we're really excited that you could be here for this. And we're really thankful to everybody who joined us tonight and everybody who joined us over the whole summer season. Um, it's been great to connect with people virtually and check up on projects that we saw sort of in process and then see where they've gone and check in with people and see what they've been doing over the past few months. Yeah. This is, we'll keep our fingers crossed for the future. And in the meantime, I hope everyone will keep working on your sourdough, keep going for that oven rise yes. um, and keep making, you know, your creative projects, whether it's music or food or in any, anything that, that we can um, through this period. Do you have any closing words for our audience, Pete? Well, I hope that people have found this, they've had a little more time, right? And I hope that it's a positive thing and that people have had a chance to spend some time doing things for themselves, right? I think that's what we have the opportunity to do. You guys, I, I typically do my trade for you guys or for, for other customers, but I got to practice it for just uh, my wife, which was pretty cool. Mm. So hopefully we get to keep doing that, but I really hope we also get to get together again soon. Yeah, definitely. Thanks, Pete. And thanks, everyone. Have a great night. Bye.